Hello and welcome back to my channel where I talk about my experience with a cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment. Um, as a reminder, if you haven't watched my diagnosis story video, um, try to look that up, but I'll try to quickly cover it in the introduction to this video. In this video, I wanna talk about um, undergoing an autologous, autologous stem cell transplant. Um, that was the second line of treatment for me when my Hodgkin lymphoma came back after six months of chemotherapy, which unfortunately was not effective in my case. That does occur, um, but thankfully now there are more treatment options that allow for you know patients with Hodg Hodgkin's lymphoma and other blood cancers to be cured and to be treated and here I am today um, it's a year and five months in remission and um, I'm not gonna sit here and sugarcoat it and say that it was easy it was not but it is doable and if you find yourself where I was um, in 2021 and then in 2022, just know that you can get through it and there is light at the end of this cancer tunnel. So the first thing I want to say is, it is called a stem cell transplant, but it is not actual surgery. <laughs> Nothing happens to you surgically. Um, Essentially, a stem cell transplant is when you get stem cells back into your system and that occurs via an IV. So stem cell transplant is not a surgery. Um, but what I will say is first I want to define what a stem cell transplant is. So as I mentioned, when chemotherapy is not effective for some blood cancers, some I believe um, autoimmune diseases, a stem cell transplant is used to help cure the disease. So what a stem cell transplant is, is there are two types of stem cell transplants. There is an autologous stem cell transplant where you are your own donor, which was my case. And then there's an allo stem cell transplant where you need to find a different donor. I will be talking about specifically an autologous stem cell transplant because that's what I went through, but know that there's also a different kind and different type. So having a stem cell transplant as your second line of treatment and as an option to cure, um, in my case, was Hodgkin's lymphoma, um, you have to understand that this is a multi-step process. So the first step is trying to get you back into remission because a stem cell transplant is prescribed when your cancer comes back, right? So this means that you have a disease occurrence for the second time, um, which is then considered refractory disease, which means that it came back and you still have active cancer in your system because your chemotherapy treatment didn't work. And so the ideal state to go into transplant is in full remission, meaning completely free of cancer. And so in order to have a transplant, you need to come back to remission. And so the first step when we talk about a stem cell transplant is whether administering chemotherapy or immunotherapy to get you back into remission, to get you back into a cancer-free state so that that cancer-free state can be captured and sustained using a stem cell transplant. So step one is either more chemotherapy or more immunotherapy, depending on what your oncologist suggests. My oncologist suggested we go the immunotherapy route, and I believe that that option is now more and more um, selected by oncologists because um, the logic behind the decision of my oncologist was that 
why would I give you more chemotherapy if it didn't work the first time? So if chemotherapy didn't work the first time, let's go the immunotherapy route and see if that's more effective. So to prepare for the stem cell transplant, I had four months to prepare where I had four infusions of two different drugs, immunotherapy drugs, that would get me hopefully to remission. So that was step one. Step two, when you are confirmed to be in remission or nearly in remission, because um, it really varies case by case, ideally you're completely free of disease. Does ideally happen every time for every patient? No, and that does not mean that a stem cell transplant will not work. That just means you have higher, you know, chances of, of, of risks or, you know, things to, to pay attention to and to look to look at. But step two would be harvesting your stem cells. And if you are listening to this video, then you probably have had chemotherapy and you've probably had those terrible shots that make your white blood cells grow, that make your bones hurt. So in order to harvest stem cells, the first thing you need to do is you need to have a whole week of infusions of that particular drug to stimulate your stem cells and your white cells to be produced in order to be harvested. So when you go through a week of um, administering those shots, then you go in for a blood test and they check your levels specifically of your stem cells. And if there's enough stem cells to harvest, then you stop the shots and the next day you prepare for harvesting your stem cells. This occurs via a special machine that filters your blood and takes the stem cells out. Some people it takes a day. For me, it only took a four hours to gather enough stem cells for the transplant. Some people it takes longer, it takes two days and they have to come back multiple days. Um, but it is a process where either your veins are used, but because I didn't have any veins, I needed to have a special port implanted in my neck just for 24 to 48 hours so that I could be attached to the machine so that my blood can be filtered through. Um, and you're hooked up to this machine and the stem cells are filtered out of your bloodstream and then collected and frozen until you're ready to get them back. Step three is actual hospital admission. So I know that um, some hospitals and some uh, infusion centers and cancer treatment centers, they do this as an outpatient procedure. Um, personally, I can't imagine how I would have done that as an outpatient procedure. It was very tough. So um, I had my transplant done at um, UCSF in San Francisco. I had an option between Stanford and UCSF and I chose UCSF. It was just closer and more convenient. Um, but I was instructed that I would be admitted to the hospital at least for three weeks. So when between the stem cell harvesting and between the hospital admission, there was a, uh, about a week of break. Um, and then when I was finally admitted to the hospital, um, that was the next step. Admission to the hospital and preparing for the stem cell transplant. Step four is the preparatory chemotherapy. And this is probably the cause for the stay and this process to be as challenging as it is. Stem cell transplant involves administering such strong chemotherapy that if your stem cells were not given back to you at the end of the chemotherapy infusions, you wouldn't be able to continue living. This chemotherapy completely wipes out your bone marrow and basically almost kills you. Stem cell transplant, put in layman's terms, is a way to unplug you and plug you back in. Essentially, chemotherapy will leave you unplugged until your stem cells are returned back to you. So for the stem cell transplant, the chemotherapy that I had was chemotherapy that it's called BEAM. 
that chemotherapy was administered over the course of six days, nonstop. Every day I received one type of the drug that's in that drug regimen, in that chemotherapy regimen. Sometimes there were days where I had chemotherapy in the morning and in the evening. Other days it was just one infusion um, lasting a variety of hours. Um, so that is the next step to survive those that week of chemotherapy. And it starts with day minus six. You do six days of chemotherapy. And then the next step would be transplant day. So the next step, and in my case, step five would be day zero, which is transplant day. And transplant day means that your bone marrow is gone. Chemotherapy did everything that it could and wiped you out. And now you're ready to receive your frozen stem cells back. And this day in the transplant world and in the chemotherapy world is considered your new birthday. Uh, I'm sure that most hospitals celebrate it as your birthday. Um, and I can share um, a video from that day for me. Um, and uh, it was very special. They, you know, they bring a cupcake, you blow out a candle, but the transplant portion itself is essentially you get an IV with your own blood cells. That's all it is. There's no cutting, no surgery. It's just a blood bag that's hung to your IV pole and within, I don't know, 20 minutes, transplant itself is done. I wanna say that the next um, portion of the transplant journey for me was the hardest. And that was when I started feeling all of the effects of the six days of chemotherapy that I endured. And one of the hardest things that happens is something called mucocytosis, which is where all of the lining in your mouth and in your intestines are gone and so it's hard to eat it's hard to talk um, and i experienced that very severely i want to say starting from day plus five or plus four and during this time i think for a week i was on pain medication around the clock and this is also when my um, white blood cell counts were completely um, bottomed out. And this is all expected. And this is why I think it's very important to be in a hospital setting during this time, because it's a very, very difficult time physically. I never thought that I wouldn't be able to stand up on my own. And during this time, I could barely stand up on my own. Um, you know, I was a patient who was able to shower herself, to dress herself, to walk around. During that week, I couldn't do any of those things. And it's a very, very hard pill to swallow. Um, and it's a very difficult time. And so it's very important that you have not only personal support of visitors, your loved ones, because you are allowed visitors. Everybody obviously needs to be masked and very careful. Um, but it's very, very important. But you also need support of the medical staff and medical staff at UCSF was exceptional. They were outstanding. These women became my family. These women became my support. Um, these women were my everything. And um, I cannot thank them enough and I can't thank the staff enough because every person who works there and who works in transplant oncology in the transplant unit, they're there because they want to be and they're there because they know how to do their job well. So for me, that was a very, very crucial um, time in my stay. And I think that like the very critical days was maybe five to six days. And then I started recovering. I was able to leave the hospital. And so the next step, and in my case, step seven would be discharge from the hospital and uh, what to do next. 
Um, I was able to leave the hospital on day plus 11 or plus 12. Can't remember at this point. Um, your mind tries to wipe such things off. Um, but my counts, my blood counts came back up fairly quickly as expected. The only, you know, uh, complications I had, I had very low platelets, which was also very common. And so I had platelet infusions. I had other blood infusions um, to help me kind of recover quicker and feel better quicker. And, you know, it's, it's, it's so amazing to like see like oh your body doesn't have platelets you're covered in little bruises you have platelets those bruises immediately go away it's, it's very interesting and i was very interested as uh, somebody who was a bio major in the past to see this all in myself um kind of my own little science experiment and how to stay positive during this whole thing but the next step after discharge is that after the stem cell transplant, there's 100 days of strict quarantine. You need a dedicated caretaker, only dedicated to you. That caretaker should have limited um, exposure to other people. So if they like work from home, that's great, but they need to be sort of available at your beck and call. I thought that that was kind of overstated, but just for context, when I came home, I have a few stairs that lead up to my door. I could barely walk up those stairs after three weeks in the hospital. And that to me was a big um, representation of how I actually felt inside, that I couldn't even walk up stairs. But you recover, this, this changes, but you do need somebody there um, to help you and my husband was there for me every step of the way. And what also made this really hard is that um, I was not able to see my daughter for three months and she was staying with my parents because we were instructed that I needed a dedicated caretaker and I also couldn't be in a house without any immune system where a toddler who went to daycare was. So that, that would have been a big disaster. So that sort of made it more difficult, but we talked you know, daily and I came back home at the end of October and within the first four weeks, my daughter was also able to come back home and join us and she restarted um, going to daycare in December. So I was discharged at the end of October. She came back home at the end of November, right before Thanksgiving, and then she restarted daycare and we still had to be careful, but and I actually started working in December also. So um, it's all doable. I, I didn't work from home, but we sort of tried to get back to our normal life um, within the first two and a half months of me being discharged from the hospital. Unfortunately, when you get your transplant, that doesn't end your treatment. Um, a lot of case studies and a lot of clinical trials have shown that um, receiving then maintenance therapy and typically it's immunotherapy of some sort for at least six months to a year um, really benefits staying in remission and having the cancer fully cured. Um, there are many drugs, multiple drugs that are, can be used for maintenance therapy. Um, if you have specific questions, you can reach out to me. Um, I know that my protocol was not standard. Um, I did receive uh, six months of maintenance treatment. Um, and it was, I want to say, eight infusions uh, because it was every three weeks or so, eight or nine. And so that would be step eight of a transplant is getting continuing to get maintenance therapy and you begin maintenance therapy within the first 100 days of your transplant. And then the last step and kind of a step that, you know, um, continues for the first year or so is you have to get revaccinated for everything. Measles, mumps, rubella, everything. Um, because your bone marrow was completely wiped and so with bone marrow, that means your immune system was completely wiped. So everything that you received as a child 
no longer applies. You have to get all your vaccines back, which is also a fun journey, but it's also doable. And um, you have to, you, you've gotten through so much, getting revaccinated is, you know, a very small piece of, 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 of everything that, that occurred to you. Um, but I will say that the first year after transplant is very difficult. Um, it's partially why I wasn't able to post um, and I wasn't posting videos for so long because I was experiencing cold on top of cold on top of cold, um, just general um, kind of weakness and tiredness and not being able to you know, feel the same way. But it does get better uh, at the year, one year mark. You do be start getting sick less. You're, you're not gonna catch every virus all the time. So stay hopeful, stay positive. It's very hard sometimes, I've been there, um, where you kind of are just at your wit's end. Like, when is this gonna end? You know, you thought the hard part ended, but then the hard part just keeps coming back and little things come up. But now that it's been over a year, I feel better. I'm managing my uh, viruses and infections and I live with a, ta with a, with a four-year-old and she constantly brings something home. Your body, learns to handle these things again and then you just have to try to live and move past everything that has happened to you you never forget it but it makes you stronger and you learn to keep going and i wish that for every one of you who's listening to this who has this journey ahead of them and know that it is possible and doable. And there's one last thing that I want to say that had a huge impact on me when I heard it and hopefully will have the same impact on you. At my last infusion to prepare me for the stem cell transplant, um, one of the infusion nurses came up to me and said, oh my god, it's your last infusion today. You're ready for the transplant. How exciting. I look at her and almost with tears in my eyes, I say, exciting. I'm not going to see my daughter for three months. Can't see people. I'm going to be in a hospital for a month at least. How is this exciting? And she looks at me and she says, Masha, when I started working as a chemotherapy nurse, this treatment wasn't an option. If chemotherapy didn't work, people passed away. You have a chance to be cured. This is your chance. Take it and be excited about it. And I never forgot those words. And I'm sitting here and hopefully you will hear these words from me and it'll have the same effect on you. To keep going, to keep fighting, because now, you know, if you have Hodgkin's lymphoma, if you have a different blood cancer, or if you have, you know, something else and you require a stem cell transplant, know that it can help you and you can be living a beautiful life on the other side. Thank you for watching and I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, comment below and I will do my best to answer them and help. Thank you.